Hello, I'm Ben Godwin. Welcome to the Word Workshop recorded at the Good Springs Full Gospel Church. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. My wife Michelle and I have pastored the Good Springs Full Gospel Church since 1999. A spirit-filled church with a hunger for God and a heart for people. Good Springs Full Gospel Church is located in Walker County on Highway 269, 10 miles south of Jasper. The prophet said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So prepare your hearts to receive from the Word, because when all else fails, God's Word works. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Glory to his name. Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 17. And we will get there in just a few moments. Praise his name. Let me show you a couple things I like that I saw. Pay more attention to your creator than your critics. How many know his opinion is what matters? It's not what other people think about you. It's what he thinks about you. Amen. How about this? Charlie Brown says, why wish on a star when you can pray to the one who created them? Amen. Makes sense to me. Amen. And Corrie Ten Boom was a Holocaust survivor. She's dead now, but she had a, a movie called The Hiding Place, uh, the book out to, and this is what she said, when a train goes through a dark tunnel, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the engineer. You may be going through a dark tunnel today, but how many trust the engineer? He knows how to get you to your destination. Amen. Well, how many can say like Snoopy, I ate too much? <laughs> I thought I'd preach on gluttony this morning and the altars would be filled. But uh, we'll, we'll go a different direction. <laughs> And how about this? Pentecostals, before service, after a Holy Ghost blowout. <laughs> how many know when you feel it, you got to get into it? Praise the Lord. Worship the Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 17. We're going to start reading with verse 11 in a moment. I want to share with you eight extreme expressions of gratitude. Eight extreme expressions of of gratitude because some situations demand a deeper level of worship. I feel like we started tapping into that this morning and we're not done yet. Amen. How many want to go deeper? Praise the Lord. We tend to think of worship as a 20 to 30 minute song service, right? In which we sing, we might clap, we might lift our hands or praise God vocally, verbally. That's a good start. But sadly, some Christians never go any deeper than that. How many know there's more than just that? In fact, Jesus said it this way in John's gospel, John 4, 24. He said, God is a spirit. Read it with me. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Now, that means a lot of things, but specifically, to worship God in truth means to worship in accordance to his word. In other words, worship God the way he wants to be worshipped. And he tells us in his word, he, he loves for us to sing. He loves for us to clap. He loves for us uh, to shout and to dance and to pray and sometimes cry. God loves all of that. That's how he built us, how he created us as emotional beings. But listen... It's also about worshiping in obedience to his word in an adherence to his will. To worship in truth means I live a life that pleases him. That's worship. How many know obedience is worship? Amen. In an adherence to his, his will. To worship him in spirit means to worship him in the deepest part of our being. In other words, just get past the flesh. Get past even your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and get down into the deepest part of your, your, your being, your spirit, and make a connection with him. 
Praise God. You know when you make that, get to that point. Hallelujah. Because it's different than anything else. I want to bring to your attention several extreme expressions of worship recorded in the Bible. Now, you could probably make a longer list, but I'm going to confine it to eight for time's sake. Each one of these could be a sermon within itself, but we're just going to hit the highlights, all right? Praise the Lord. Number one is right here in Luke chapter 17, the grateful leper. Let's read about it. Verse 11, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers. What does the rest say? Who stood what? Why did they stand afar off? They had to. By Mosaic law, Levitical law, they had to keep their distance and call out, unclean, if anybody approached them. So they're at a distance. All right? Look at verse 13. And they lifted up their voices. How many know it's all right to get loud? <laughs> we Pentecostals have no trouble with that, do we? <laughs> they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself to the priest. Now that was standard procedure. Only a priest could declare somebody clean of leprosy. They didn't have doctors and clinics like we do today. They had to go to the priest, be examined, and if they were, the leprosy was gone, they were pronounced clean and could be reintroduced to society. So notice this. Jesus makes no fanfare. He doesn't anoint them with oil. He doesn't lay hands on them. No prayer line. None of those things. He just says go. And I love what the Bible says next. Praise God. And so it was that as they went, somebody say, as they went, as they acted on his word, as they stepped out in faith and in obedience to what Jesus said, something happened. How many know God still works that way today? They were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. Now here's where you get a little extreme, all right? With a loud voice glorified God. Not just a casual, hallelujah. You know, some people think it's a big effort to lift one hand halfway and say, thank you, Jesus. But, you know, when a flag's flown at half mass, what does that usually indicate? <laughs> hallelujah! <laughs> what, think about this. What does it mean when we lift our hands in worship to God? It means I surrender. If somebody stuck a gun in your back, what would you do? Yeah. Well, what are we doing when we lift our hands and our voices to God? We're surrendering to him. I had three older brothers. I learned to surrender real fast. We'd have wrestling matches and tussles and, and oh yeah, we'd get after it, man. We'd have, we'd have a, a real fight. And I learned that word, that magic word that got me out of trouble a lot. Anybody know what it was? Uncle. Uncle, yeah, I surrender, I give up. Somebody here today, you need to say, I surrender to Jesus. You need to say, I give up my will, my agenda, and I surrender to your will, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So these lepers, look what, or this one leper, look what he does. With a loud voice, he glorified God. Look at verse 16, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. That kind of implies the other nine were Jews. And if that were the case, maybe because they sensed we're God's people, they had a, maybe a sense of entitlement. I don't know. I don't want to read too much into this, but I do know one thing. This guy felt unworthy, and he came and fell at the feet of Jesus. A normal hallelujah wouldn't do. He lifted up his voice, and he fell on his face, and he expressed his worship and gratitude for what God had done. Verse 17 so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? One out of ten, that's only ten percent. I want to be in the ten percent. Look at somebody say, I want to be in the minority that's thankful, that's worth it, willing to praise him. Hallelujah. Before he went home to his wife, before he went home to his children, if he had any, before he went back to his boss and his job, if he had one, hallelujah, he, he didn't even go to the temple first, hallelujah, and show himself to the priest. He came back to Jesus and said, thank you. 
with a loud voice and falling on his face at his feet. That's what I call extreme expression of worship. Jesus has healed us from the terminal disease of sin. If that man made an effort to praise him, how many believe we should make an effort to praise him? Amen. Well, that's one. All right. Let's look at the second one. How about this? We know this. I preached on it not too long ago, so I'm just going to touch on it. Miriam and the Israelite women. You remember that story? Exodus 15 is called the Song of Moses. You remember what happened? God opened the Red Sea, drowned Pharaoh and his army right there and delivered the children of Israel from 400 plus years of slavery. I would have gotten excited too. Miriam got her tambourine. There's some other tambourine. Get one of those, Noah. I know you always got tambourine, sister. Get some of those others. Come on. Let's, let's make some noise. Hallelujah. Can you imagine hundreds and thousands of women on the beach? Hallelujah. Saying the Lord is a man of war. The Lord hath triumphed gloriously. His horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Hallelujah. Say, oh, that's too radical. Oh, that's too fanatical. Oh, yeah, if you've been in bondage for 400 years and you saw the Egyptians that were going to kill you or drag you back to slavery drowned in front of your eyes, you would have magnified the Lord too. Well, hallelujah. Here's what she said. Exodus 15, 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, faithful in praises, doing wonders? Praise God. Talk about a crimson tide. All those bloody bodies washing up on the, on the shore, the, the Red Sea. My, my, they had camp meeting on the beach. <laughs> Woo, how many know you can have church anywhere? It don't have to be in church. Amen? Glory to his wonderful name. Well, God has brought us out of bondage, delivered us from slavery to Satan and sin. We ought to praise him too. We ought to praise him too. You say, oh, Brother Ben, I, I just don't get very emotional. I like to be dignified. You weren't last night at about 530, I bet. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> Brother Mike tells a hilarious story about this feisty old woman. They were having one of those knock-down drag-out services. Anybody ever been in one of those? Somebody knocks the devil down, somebody drags him out. Hallelujah. I mean, it was just a Pentecostal free-for-all, it seemed like. And this feisty woman came up, shaking her finger at his face. And she said, I want you to know we have the Holy Spirit at our church too, but he's a dignified Holy Spirit. <laughs> he said, they must have got the wrong one on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> These are not drunk as you suppose. See, and it's but the fourth hour of the day, how at 9 a.m., but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. How many know God's still looking for willing vessels? Hallelujah. Make us a willing vessel. All right, here's number three. You taking these down? Number three, David dancing. We started in the New Testament. Now we're going back in the Old Testament. David dancing before the ark. I love this story. The first time David tried to move the ark to his tabernacle in Jerusalem, it was a fiasco resulting in a funeral. You remember, they carelessly put the ark of the covenant on an ox cart. And they pulled it along like common cargo. They must have been walk, uh, driving in Walker County because they hit a pothole. And that ark started teeter-tottering on that cart. And Uzzah reached out his hand to steady it so it wouldn't fall. And he was stricken dead in the presence of God. And everybody's like, whoa, what's going on? What's going on? And so they parked the ark for three months at the house of a man named Obed-Edom. By the way, during that time, God blessed everything pertaining to his family. Hallelujah. That's a whole other sermon. And so David does research. How can we bring the ark? How can we bring the ark? We want to do this. We want to handle it properly. And he finds out it's not supposed to be carried on a cart like cargo. It's supposed to be hoisted on the shoulders of the priest held high in honor and in, in esteem. Hallelujah. And so they have a procession, a second processional into Jerusalem. 
And the Bible describes it vividly there in 2 Samuel chapter 6. David could have sat in his palace and dictated or spectated, but instead he led the festive parade with music and singing and shouting and dancing. He didn't act stoic. He didn't act like a statue, dignified like a king. No, he got so excited he could not contain his joy. Anybody ever been there before? Woo, hallelujah. And he broke out in extreme worship. Here's what it says, 2 Samuel 6, 14. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And he was wearing a linen ephod. That's a, a priestly vestment. In other words, he took off his regal, royal robe of a king and he assumed the, the, the humble attire of a priest. And he danced before the Lord with all of his might. Hallelujah. Can't you just see him cutting the rug down, down through the streets of Jerusalem? Woo, hallelujah. Oh, yeah, the God who, who, who enabled me to defeat Goliath, the God who kept me from King Saul for over a decade, the God who exalted me from the pasture to the palace, I'm going to worship him and I'm going to praise his name. Well, not everybody was happy. If you start getting extreme worshiping God, there's going to be naysayers and critics. Look down. Uh, they're just getting emotional. His own wife looks out of the window, Michael, and is disgusted by what she sees and despises him in her heart. And she's sarcastic. Listen to what she says. 2 Samuel 6.20 Michael said, how glorious, this is sarcasm, was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. He wasn't prancing around naked. He had a priestly garment on. She wanted him to act dignified like a king. He wanted to get down with the presence of God and be a priest. Kings rule but preserve. Anybody with me? And here's what David said. I love his answer, man. Hallelujah. 2 Samuel 6, 21. It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over his people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. I will be even more undignified and will be humble in my own sight. Let me translate that into modern slang. You ain't seen nothing yet, girl. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. He worshiped God with an extreme expression. And God was pleased. And his presence filled that tabernacle. Ready for the next one? Number four. How about Solomon's temple dedication? Solomon had a philosophy. His philosophy was go big or go home. I mean, after all, the guy had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He did everything in excess, didn't he? But he started out right, and then he drifted from God and allowed a lot of his wives to turn him to idolatry. But while he was right with God, after seven years of construction on the temple, it was time to dedicate this magnificent edifice, the new home of the Ark of the Covenant, and Solomon and Israel offered extreme offerings and sacrifices. Listen to what the Bible says. 22,000 oxen were offered up as a burnt offering. 120,000 sheep were offered up as burnt sacrifices to God. How many say that's, that's a little extreme? That's a little extravagant. Yeah, but Solomon was saying if it's for God... I'm going to do my best. If it's for God, I'm going to do my best. He deserves the glory. Amen. And listen to what happened. Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. How I many know oh, there's power in unity? When God's people get together and worship, there's power in that agreement hallelujah and when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the lord saying for he is good 
and his mercy endures forever. That the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Hmm. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. I challenge somebody to say, God, do it again. They came together in unity and in praise and in prayer. And God smiled on it. God put his stamp of approval on it. And God showed up and showed up out with a cloud of glory. His Shekinah glory filled that temple. And it wasn't a fog machine. It wasn't man-made stuff. It was God's glory. Oh, somebody say, God, do it again. Fill your temple with your glory. We all know this scripture, don't we? Psalm 22, 3 says, he inhabits what? The praise of his people. That means to live in, dwell in. It means to sit down as a judge in the seat of honor. Just like the Shekinah glory of God hovered over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The glory of God. Hallelujah. Hovered in that temple. And how many know the glory of God wants to permeate our lives? Amen. Sincere praise and worship is irresistible to God. It attracts his attention. I know I have a quirky sense of humor sometimes, but I can just imagine God. When we were worshiping God a few minutes ago, singing holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I'm desperate for you. We were singing. I could just see God say to the angels, shh, be quiet. I want to hear this. How many had a big feast for Thanksgiving? Did the aroma fill the whole house? This lady put on some collards in that crock pot. Oh, Nelly, hallelujah. Mm, Chicken and dressing that chicken boiling in that. Hallelujah. Oh, man, all the trimmings, the whole house just smelled with the aroma. Nostalgia. What do you think it is to God when his people get together in worship? He's like, it's a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God. That's your prayer, your praise. Extreme expressions. All right, let's move on. Number five, you get anything out of this? The Magi, or Magi, however you pronounce it, bringing their treasures. We'll talk more about this through the month of December. They saw the star. This is something we don't always realize. They traveled nearly two years for an opportunity to worship the Christ child. See, the shepherds, they saw the angel the night of Jesus' birth. They came immediately. The wise men saw the star appear at his birth, but it took them nearly two years to get there. In fact, when they come in and present their gifts, Jesus is not a babe in a manger. He's a small child. He is a toddler. You understand? These guys traveled hundreds of miles on a camel. Have you ever ridden on a camel? They're not very comfortable. These guys were willing to forfeit everything for two years of their life to come and present their treasures to Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of us can barely make it to church in a luxury car. God forbid it rains. Not picking on you this morning. Matthew 2, 11, and when they had come into the house, notice it's not a stable, it's not a cave, it's not a barn, they'd come into the house. This was later. They come into the house, they saw the young child, not the babe, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshiped. These were scholars. These were men of wealth and influence and affluence. They didn't just sit there, oh, he's a cute baby, God bless you, we're going back. No, they fell down and worshiped on their face at his feet to worship the newborn king. And they opened their treasures, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Think about this. How did Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus afford to flee to Egypt for an extended time and stay until the death of Herod? I'll tell you how. I'm sure Joseph picked up odd jobs in carpentry, but they had gold. 
That's a gift fit for a king. They had frankincense. That's what priests would burn in their ministry before the Lord. And they had myrrh, which was prophetic, another spice prophetic of Jesus' death because they would embalm the dead with myrrh. All of that is symbolic. All of that. They came two years of travel just for an opportunity to worship the newborn king. Hallelujah. That's extreme expression. We all are familiar with this one, right? Mary anointing Jesus' feet. Mary is the sister whose worship was world famous. Because Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 13, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be remembered as a memorial to her. You know the story. She brought her alabaster box. And box is, is somewhat of a misnomer. When we think of a box, we think of something square, wooden, or whatever. It wasn't that kind of box. It was like a flask or a bottle or some, a container of liquid, probably made out of, of, of gypsum stone. This, this fragrant or an ointment was imported from far regions away. It was very expensive. It was probably the most valuable possession Mary had. It could have been an heirloom that she was saving for her wedding night. She was so overwhelmed with gratitude and thankfulness because Jesus had raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. She said, I'm not saving this for another time. <laughs> she broke that alabaster box, poured its content. And here's the thing. The Bible tells us how much it was. Not only the quantity, it was one pound, which is 12 ounces, give or take, depending on ancient measurements, but it was also 300 pence. A pence was a day's wage. You do the math, that's 300 days worth of salary or wages. So nearly a year's worth of wages. Most perfume bottles, lady, how many ounces are in them? One, two, three ounces maybe? She poured out 12 ounces on Jesus. Nearly a year's worth of wages. And Judah said, why wasn't that sold to the poor? Such a waste. This is too extravagant. Jesus said, it's okay, buddy. The poor that you have always with you. If you study the Gospels close, it wasn't just Judas that was complaining. All of them started fussing about it. Oh, my God, what a waste. This, this is just a scandal. This is awful. <laughs> Not to Mary. He was worth every penny. I said he was worth every penny. How many lift your hand and say he is worthy? That's an extreme expression. All right, I'm about to wind down. Number seven is the Palm Sunday crowd. We know the story well, don't, they? don't we? Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey. Isn't, it, isn't that ironic? He was born in a borrowed stable, preached his first sermon on a, in a borrowed boat, came into Jerusalem in a, on a borrowed donkey, had the, the Last Supper in a borrowed upper room, and was finally buried in a borrowed grave. How many know when he comes back, he's not going to borrow anything? He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords for all of eternity. Hallelujah. And here he comes into Jerusalem on this borrowed donkey, and they start pulling the palm fronds off the, the, the trees, and they start taking off their outer garments, strewing them in the, in the roadway so the donkey can walk upon them. And they start chanting and singing and dancing, Hosanna, blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Guess what the scribes and the Pharisees said about that? See, it's religious people that'll get upset when you really get turned on to Jesus. Oh, help me. I'm getting in trouble. Hallelujah, Luke 19. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice. Praise God with a loud voice. For all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why do they want him to rebuke the disciples? They're having a good time. They're having camp meeting, man. Tell you why. Two reasons. Number one, they're saying, Blessed is the king. 
You say king and the Romans are in earshot, they're going to come and, and, and put down any political uprising. They're nervous. Don't get the Romans stirred up. There's another reason, because they're saying, Hosanna. We Gentiles don't understand that term, but the Jews understand that is a plea to the Messiah to come and save us. In other words, they're saying he's not only the king, he's the Messiah. Tell them to be quiet. Tell them to, to hold their peace. And I love what Jesus said. I want, I want you to get this reference. Look at this. It says right here, but he answered and said to them, I tell you that if he should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Woo, hallelujah. I don't know about you. I'm not going to let a rock take my place. I'm not going to let a rock steal my inheritance. I'm going to praise him. If I have voice, I'm going to praise him. If I have breath in my lungs, I'm going to praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to his wonderful name. Why, why are all these people giving God and Jesus extreme expressions of worship? Because of what worship means. Worship comes from two words, worth and ship. The quality of being worthy. Just like ownership is the quality of being an owner. Leadership is the quality of being a leader. Worship is the quality of being worthy. And the cry goes out in Revelation chapter 5. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? The Bible says that a search was made and no man was found worthy either in heaven or in earth or under the earth. And John said, I wept much because no man was found worthy. One of the elders taps him on the shoulder and said, it's okay, weep not. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And when John turns around, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb as it had been slain. Why? Because to the world, Jesus will return as a lion roaring out the judgments of God. But to the church and those that love him, he will come back as a lamb. Hallelujah. Who has redeemed us back to God by his blood. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And here's where we see the eighth and final. There's probably more, but for this list, the throng at the throne. What do they do? How do they react? How do they respond to the lamb? I'll tell you how they do. The 24 elders fall down on their face and they cast their crowns at him and they say, thou art worthy. Let me read just a little bit of this. And the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them a harp and golden vials of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. I believe when we get to heaven, there's going to be some songs we never heard before. The songs the angels cannot sing because they, they can't relate. They don't know what it's like to be saved and delivered and redeemed from sin. Hallelujah. Well, look what it says. It says, and they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy. Somebody say, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Listen, say how many were there? The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million if my math is right. And thousands of thousands. Keep multiplying exponentially. You're talking billions and trillions of angels around the throne of God singing worthy is the lamb. Holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty. Heaven and earth is full of your glory. Say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and forever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped him forever and forever. I plan to be in that throng. I said, I plan to be in that, that innumerable multitude on that crystal sea before the throne of God. 
Praise God. I've, I've had the privilege of worshiping God ever since I was a kid and could understand what worship was all about. But one day, hallelujah, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hallelujah. I'll be there before the throne of God and I'll give him all of my praise, all of my worship, all of my adoration. Look at somebody say, we're just getting started. I'm going to offend somebody right now. Somebody's not going to like what I'm about to say. You might be mad at me. You may not want to come back and hear me preach. But if you don't learn the secret of enjoying worship, pray tell what are you going to do in heaven. Worship. Why? Because he is worthy. I said he is worthy. The musicians are coming right now, and I want us to just spend a few minutes in worship. I've given you eight examples of extreme expressions of gratitude and worship. And listen, my friends, if Jesus could hang naked in agony and shame on that cross and hold out his hand for six hours while people mocked him and spat upon him and abused him in every possible way, Surely we can lift our hands for just a few minutes and say, thank you, Jesus. Will you stand with me now? We're in a holy place. We're in an atmosphere where miracles can happen. Come on, I want you to just take a couple of minutes. We're not going to keep you all day. Just take a minute. Just worship. Just honor Him. Just praise Him. If you want prayer or need prayer, come. While we sing. But if we don't pray for anybody, let's, let's just lavish him with our praise. Heap your adoration upon him. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and blessing and power. We need you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We're not ashamed to lift holy hands. We're not ashamed to open our mouth and to worship you. If you want prayer, come. Otherwise, sing and worship. Oh, you are awesome. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Ben Godwin thanking you for watching our broadcast today. I pray it has been a blessing and a source of spiritual enrichment for you and your family. I'd like to invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view many more singing and preaching videos. Search for Good Springs Full Gospel Church at youtube.com. Also, please visit our website at goodspringsfgc.org where you can learn more about our church and ministry, read many of my articles on a variety of subjects, find a direct link to our YouTube channel, shop our online store, and donate to our church and help support our TV ministry with debit, credit card, or PayPal. Also, you can mail in an offering the old-fashioned way to Good Springs Full Gospel Church, PO Box 3161, Jasper, Alabama, 35502. If we can assist you in any way in your spiritual journey, please contact us. And remember, when all else fails, God's Word works.